All right, so uh, we say uh, shalom and baruch uh, haba, welcome, and erev uh, tov, good evening. This is our uh, advanced grammar class, and um, I've missed a couple of weeks, so I'm kind of out of uh, <coughs> kilter here um, due to uh, a situation that, uh, that we had uh, in the family a couple of weeks ago, and then last week, of course, was uh, Rosh Hashanah. And so, uh, but good to be back again and uh, get back into it uh, somewhat. Um, and uh, also uh, letting everyone know that probably in about three weeks or so, we will be starting, four weeks, maybe a month, uh, we'll be starting our new uh, Thursday night Hebrew class, uh, beginner Hebrew class. So. Uh, if you know anyone who is interested in that, uh, please let them know uh, that it will be from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock, más o menos, more or less. Um, sometimes, uh, a lot of times, we go past 9 o'clock, of course, as you know. But um, um, we will be starting the new uh, Thursday night Hebrew class. Um, I was trying to get past the uh, Sukkot, yeah. trying to get through the holidays. It will be the 26th, it will be the so the boss over here, the boss lady says the 26th. All right. You have to have a week off. So thank you. 26th. So October 26th, uh, which is mom's birthday. Um, so anyway, yes, we'll be starting that. Also, uh, because of the way things went today, um, and it's kind of been like one of those weeks. Um, but anyway, the way things went today, and especially this afternoon, um, I walked out of the house without my laptop, and um, so we're winging it tonight. Not really, I do have information for you, but um, I don't have the trip life information for you, so, but I did have something else anyway that I wanted to go to. So we have two words up here on the board, and so please write them down. Barakara. Do I need to go over there and stick my tongue out to you? So first of all, we're going to start with this one right here. Okay? So, who knows what this word is? There you go. It's, Abby says you should go like this. I don't know. I don't know. Hakad or Pachad? Hakad or it's Kakad. Kakad. I can never remember if the Babesh is the or the Kakad. You know what? I, okay. I'm sorry. See, uh, it's one of those days. It's my fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> It's one of those days. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. All right. I'm sorry. I threw everybody completely off. <laughs> that was a trick question. All right, try that one. What's the problem? Same. Cafe or cafe? I'll give you leeway since, I'm, since my brain is not here, kapad. your brain doesn't have to be here tonight either. Kapad or kapad? Kapad. Everyone say kapad. 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 All right. I'm sorry. Uh, so, give it to me. And it's got... And it's got... So, kapad. Kapad. And because the, the P has a dagesh in it, you would double P. And this word means, this is a verb. To cover. To cover. Very good. Who said that? Very good. To cover. 
Yes, very good. So from this, we get the word Kippah. Kippah. And Kippah means a cover. It is from kippa. Notice the the, the the kaf and the pe. The word cap to cover. Can you all see this? Yeah. Notice that you have everything the same here. Your root, right? If I go like this, okay. This tells you what. This is a noun. This is also a noun. This tells you what? It's feminine. Feminine. Okay, so this tells you that it is feminine. So what's it, what is this? Kepara. 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 Coming from kapa. So you already have the idea. Okay, so what is the kapara? Kapara means cover. And it is from this term here into this term here, watch the relationship from this term to this term, that we have this term So we have what? Yom, Yom Kippur. Okay, not Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the fish, all right? It's not Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Yom. Everyone say Yom. Yom Kippur. Okay. And literally, if you remember, we talked about this on Shabbat in Leviticus tw twenty-three. It is not called Yom Kippur, but it is literally called what? Yom Kippurim. Kippurim makes it plural. Now, Kippurim is plural. What? Plural what? Mas masculine. masculine. But we said that the word is what? Feminine. So why? A masculine ending here. Does that help you? This is an adjective, this is a noun. The adjective has to follow the same thing. The adjective has to follow. So because, yom is because yom is masculine, then the adjective must also be masculine. masculine. Okay, so keep reading. Now, we could say, we could say, and it's called because 
properly, in proper, in, uh, proper English, in proper Hebrew, it would be called Yom Kippur, because Yom is what? Day. But Yom is what? Singular or plural? Singular. Singular. And this is what? Plural. So you have a problem here. Because the, what does the rule say? That whatever the noun is, the adjective must follow. So if this is singular, this should also be singular, which is why it's usually called Yom Kippur. But in the scriptures, it is called Yom Kippurim. So it breaks the rule. Okay? So this is the, the, uh, the noun construct chain. Do you remember the noun construct chain? Where you have two nouns, kapara, okay, and one is, uh, one changes and one does not change. One is concrete, does not change, the other is abstract, it changes. And so this is the abstract. And you remember what goes in between. So we're going to have to start our Hebrew lessons all over again. You remember what goes in between? Understood. Understood what? Of. Of. Very good. Joey, you are on top of it today. <laughs> Understood of. Remember, this is where in modern Hebrew you have the word shed. But in old Hebrew, they had no preposition of in between here like this. <clears throat> Day of atonement is how it's translated in English, correct? Day of atonement. The of is understood. In Hebrew, it is very simply Yom Kippur. Day of atonement. Very good. However, it is what Yom Kippurim is the proper title of it. But Kippur, Kippur, Kippurim does not mean atonement. The idea of atonement is there, but it does not mean atonement. It means what? Covering. The day of coverings. It means to cover. What's up, Kara? So what? So here you have kapara, which means what? Cover. Okay, so are you ready? This. This is the word that is used for the, the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. It's called a kipara. The lid on the Ark of the Covenant is called a kipara. Simply what? The cover. the cover. In Christianity, this has been called what? The mercy seat. The mercy seat. <coughs> but in Hebrew, it is just very simply called ha kapara, the cover. Why? There's a play on words taking place here. Because this day is called what? Yom Hakipuri. The day of coverings. As we discussed on Shabbat with you, that um, why is it called Kippurim rather than simply Kippur? Leviticus chapter 23, you can go there and read it in your Hebrew Bible where the festivals are discussed and Yom Kippur is discussed there. And if you look at the Hebrew, it does not say Yom Kippur, it says Yom Kippurim. <laughs> Literally, the day of coverings, plural. <coughs> Why? Because there is a threefold covering that takes place. The first, the the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, had to cover for himself. Then he had to cover the nation. for the nation, Israel. And then he had to cover for the Goyim, for the Gentile nations. You see, the act of atonement is not simply an act 
for Judaism, but it is an act for the whole world. And so for this reason, it is called Kippuri, the coverings. So do you remember how he covers? And this is the play on word. He's going to cover the cover. Or he's going to cover the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. It is on this day. This is called Shabbat Shabbat. This is the High Holy Day. This is the holiest day of the year. Of all the festivals, this is the most holy. And so, what is it that he does? On this day of the year, only on this day of the year, the high priest would enter into the Kadosh Kedoshim, the Holy of Holies. He would enter with what? A bowl, in which was the blood of the bull that had been slain. <coughs> he would bring it in. He would dip his finger into the blood and seven times he would sprinkle the blood on the kippah, on the lid. By the way, the lid was considered a separate piece of furniture from the rest of the ark. Do you remember that there were, how did the ark look? It was a box, maybe a little bit smaller than this table, as far as length is concerned, maybe a little bit wider than this table. So you kind of have an imagination here of what it looked like about this size. And it stood about that high off of the ground. You remember what was on each side? Sure. Yes, they had the poles on the side. And what else? What was standing on each end? You said, except for say it properly? Cherubim. Cherubim. So everyone say Cherubim. And a cherub, a cherub, cherub is, a, is what? An angel. Okay. Remember that these are the, what kind of angels? The warrior angels. He said, Kharav means sword. These are the, are the sword carriers, sword bearers. So these are the sword bearing angels. This is the angel which God put in the garden to guard against them eating the tree of life. All right, so at each end of the ark, the ark, by the way, the word for ark in Hebrew is the Haron. Uh, excuse me, Aaron. Aaron is Aaron. Our own is Ark. Bring our own, the Ark of the Covenant. Or our own coming. Okay? So, um, so you have these angels standing at each side. It is believed that Either, there are two, two ways, two versions of how this went. One group says that the ark was attached to the angels. The other says that the lid was attached to the angels. But either way that the lid, that the kippara was considered to be a separate piece of furniture. And that this is the reason why this is called the mercy seat in Christianity. This is the throne, so to speak. This represents the throne of God. This is his seat. And you remember that the wings of the angels touched overhead. And so it would be picked up as an entirety. But they were, in fact, two separate pieces of furniture. And so you have the Aaron itself, and then you have the Kippara, the cover. <coughs> and it was upon this cover that the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, would come in, sprinkle seven times. He would go out, he would get another bowl of blood, he would come back in, he would sprinkle seven times. 
He would go out, he would get another bowl of blood, and he would come in and he would sprinkle seven times. Seven meaning? Perfection. Meaning? Completeness. Okay? Perfection does not mean what we think of perfection as meaning. Perfection means something is complete. As in a perfect week, seven, seven days, a perfect week is a complete week. You've completed the week. You've gone through the seventh day. So it is a complete week. So you have kappa to cover. Okay? Uh, you have kippara, the cover. So you have Yom Kippur, the day of covering. The day of covering. What is this about? That he is covering over. Our sins, our errors, our mistakes, our trespasses. That he is covering them over, that he is papering over them, so to speak, that he's whitewashing them. This does not mean that you did not sin. This means that you sinned, and in effect, God looked the other way. As the scripture says, love. Say it again, real love. Love, love covers, the covers a multitude of sin. What is he referring to when he says that love covers a multitude of sin? Where does this come from? From Kappa. What? That Yom Kippur. We know it as the day of judgment. But it is also a day of what? It's a day of love and grace and mercy. Because love covers the multitude of sin. And this is what Yom Kippur was all about. It was about covering. Whitewashing. Though your sins be as but as though your sins be as scarlet. What color is scarlet? Joey's shirt right there. They will be what? So if you've ever been, has anybody here ever been like deer hunting or anything like that? On a cold snowy winter's day? <laughs> Down here in South Texas. <laughs> well, you did have that one day, like, how many years? Ten years ago or something. <laughs> how do you know that you hit the animal on a cold, snowy winter day and you shoot a deer? How do you know that the deer has been shot? Where do you see the blood? <laughs> on the snow. And it makes a very stark contrast, and in fact, what you can trail the deer through the snow simply by following the drops of blood. This is what our sin appears to God. This is the way it appears to Him. That it is a stark contrast between. What we are, how we act, what we do, and Himself. So that Romans 3.23 says what? For have and fall short of <laughs> So you have this stark contrast. This is who we are. This is who He is. This is what we are. This is what He is. And we do not measure up. If we do not measure up, how can we enter in? 
You see, there must be an equal relationship in a covenant, in a contract. But I do not measure up to God in this contract. So how do I make contract with Him if I do not measure up to the contract? Therefore, He... So, if... Well, let's use gambling. Not that we're gambling people, but let's use gambling. <laughs> so if you make a bet, if you make a bet and your horse doesn't come in, so you are now what? In the hole. Short. Very good. In the hole. <laughs> Somebody knows. Not that I would know. Not that I would have heard. <laughs> Should we use dogs instead? Josh, anyway. Josh told me. <laughs> so you're in the hole. And you don't have the cash to do this. And they're going to maybe pop your knees or something. <laughs> maybe Nora's going to pop your knees. Anyway. So, you call up a friend. Don't call me. You call up a friend. And you say, what well, can you cover me? Cover me. Why? I'm short. I do not have sufficient. Correct? So, by covering you what? I'm pa papering over with money your deficiency. <clears throat> this is what this is all about. This is what atonement is all about. Where I am falling short, God is covering me. He's making up the deficiency for me. So that in effect, I can be at a place where I can be in covenant, in contract with Him. This is what the atonement is all about. So, I had a rabbi explain it to me this way. What? Making sure we're still awake over here with the cameras. Haha, yes. I stood still for too long. Josh is scoring over there. Watch this. So this is the way. Okay. And this should ring some bells with you. Okay. He said if you take this word and you go like this. Now what have we done? At one minute. This is what atonement means, at one minute. Meaning what? This is the key right here, at one. Do you remember what Yeshua prays before he goes to be executed? Before he gives up his life? <coughs> okay, but he's praying for, he's praying for the Talmudim, he's praying for the disciples. And he talks about how the Father is in Him, and He is in the Father. And he says, and we are one. And then what does he say? He says, what? He is in me, I am in Him, and you are in me. Say what? At one. Do you see what I'm saying here? Do you see what's taking place here? This is a relationship uh, understanding, a balance in the relationship. And this isn't Christianity, this is Judaism. A Christianity takes the concept, yes, but understand that this was occurring long before Christianity ever appeared on the scene. This was their understanding of it. We call it tikkun, reparation. The reparation of the world. To be repaired. To be Reconciled. 
So does that ring a bell with you? That we, Rav Shaul, the Apostle Paul says what? That we may be reconciled where? Who? Unto God. That we may be reconciled unto God. Now how do I do this? How does this occur? Because I have already fallen short. I have already fallen short. So, this is why the scripture asks the question, can a leopard change his spots? Can you change who you are? Can you change who you are? No. 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 <clears throat> Therefore, say what? I am a sinner. I have trespassed. Could Adam and Chava take it back? No. Once they cross the line, could they cross back over? Yeah. No. Once they cross the line, the line has been crossed. And they could not cross back over. It is done. The same is true with you and with me. Say what? Can I go back and fix yesterday? Can I go back? Can I have a mulligan? Golf, you know, that's where you mess up with your stroke or whatever, and so they give you a gimme, right? Or they give you another, another opportunity. But do you get yesterday back to do it all over again? No. no. And the truth is this. This is the danger of our situation. Not only can you not go back and fix yesterday. What has happened has happened. What is done is done. So not only can you not go back and fix yesterday. But you only have a limited number of days to deal with. <clears throat> you only have a limited number of days to deal with. And... We do not know what that number is. And for every person, it is a different number. I do not know, nor do you know, how long our life is going to last. So our time in this world, in this lifespan, is a limited number. It is different for every human being, and no one knows what that number is. Which is why David says, teach me to number my days. What, what does he mean to number my days? To make each day count. Why? Because I cannot go back and redo today. The things that have come out of my mouth today, the actions that I've done, the thoughts that I've done, that I've spent my time doing, I cannot go back and redo. Therefore, what? I've sinned, I've transgressed, I've broken, I've gone the wrong way, I've gone astray. And this is who and what I am, and a leopard cannot change his spots. Because a leopard cannot change his spots, because I am, in fact, imperfect, incomplete, because I am, in fact, a sinner, a transgressor, who, has, who falls short, I can never make that up. I can never make that shortage up. I will always be short. I will always be incomplete. As long as I'm in this life and in this world, I will be short and I will be incomplete. So, if I am short and I am incomplete, then how can I be reconciled to one who is absolutely perfect, who is absolutely complete? I need someone 
who will cover me and make up the shortage. And the one who covers me to make up the shortage is Mashiach, is the Messiah. And the Talmud expresses this, the Talmud talks about this, that the life, the sacrifice of the life of a tzaddik, of a righteous man, covers his people, covers his generation. Yeshua is the tzaddik, and the sacrifice of his life covers me. It is my covering. My deficiency, my shortage is made up by his righteousness and his sacrifice. So that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be called the righteousness, the tzadah, the righteousness of God. So, this is what Qatar is all about. How do we get from covering? to atonement. Well, this is how. By covering us, He's reconciling us back to God. So, Yom Kippur, um, on Yom Kippur, we go through a litany. It's called Vidui. V-I-D-D-U-I. Vidui. Everyone say Vidui. Vidui. This is a litany. And this is a particular part of the service, which we will go through twice. We will go through Vidui um, on Erev Yom Kippur, Friday evening. And then we will go through it again on Shabbat. What is Vidui all about? And so, uh, in, in doing this, explaining a little bit about the Yom Kippur service, um, understand first that the Yom Kippur service is what we would call very liturgical. Um, that is that it is that if we in in on Yom Kippur through all the services we follow the Siddur we follow the book of prayer the prayer book Siddur if you remember I explained this on Rosh Hashanah on the evening of Rosh Hashanah while we were here last Wednesday I explained about the about the Siddur we have the word Siddur which is called a prayer book. And from this we have the word Seder. And so remember we talked about that we have a Seder on Pesach, on Passover, which we most people think that Seder means what? A meal. <clears throat> because we call it a Passover Seder, so the Seder is that you're going to sit down and you're going to eat. We also have a Rosh Hashanah Seder because we do sit down and eat. But Seder means order. to be ordered, yes, ordered. To be in order. Meaning what? That you don't just sit down and eat. There's no order. 
but there is an order to the eating. So first you eat this and everybody eats it together. Then you eat this and, then, and everybody eats it together. Then you eat this and everybody eats it together. So first what? Everybody drinks the cup and everybody eats the matzah, right? We start off with this and then what? You dip the parsley into the salt water to represent the tears of Israel and to represent what? The striking of the blood on the doorposts and so forth and so on. And you remember that last week we had an order, remember? You got your plates, which you were able to eat freely, but then you had the separate plate, which had what? Carrots, beets, onions, fish, pomegranate, fig. And dates, and we, and we ate them in order. Okay, so this is Seder. So Sidor means to be ordered. Why? So that it is uniform. So that we're doing the same thing. So that we're all working together. So Sidur is the book in which the Rachot, the Tekelim, the prayers are. The blessings and the prayers and such as that, the order. So this is, this is the liturgy. This is what we mean by the liturgy. So Yom Kippur, we follow the Siddur. We follow the order. And everything is in order. Why? We are duplicating the temple service. That's where this comes from. And the Chassal, the sages teach us that it was Ezra who set up this order upon the return from Babylon, so that everyone would be doing the same thing. Why should we all be doing the same thing? Because there are some who are strong and there are some who are weak. So what? The strong do what? They lift up the weak. But what we're not to do is everyone doing whatever, their own thing, their own way, however they want. As we have said many times, whenever it says, and they did whatever was right in their own eyes, never ends well. Everybody's just doing his own thing. Doing whatever comes into their mind, or to spiritualize it, whatever comes into my heart. And we use this thing when you, know, you hear, well, God placed this on my heart. So I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this. In Judaism, the service is very structured. And it is not that everyone is doing their own thing, however, whenever, wherever they want. The Apostle Paul speaks to this in 1 Corinthians. When he speaks about the organization of the assembly, and he says that God is not the author of confusion. God is a God of order. Who set up the temple service? Huh? Ezra did. Ezra set up the, lit the, the liturgy for us. But who set up the temple service? Huh? Moses. Moses? God. God did. God instituted the temple service. God said, you shall not worship me, however you will. God said, you may not offer your sacrifices wherever you will. Once the altar was in place, God said, only here may you offer your sacrifices and only in this way. This is very contrary to modern day thinking. And where you see when you see what's going on in in many churches. The service, we call it service for a reason. Service means what? To serve. 
to worse to work. Avoda literally means what? Put it in Google Translate. Put work in Google Translate and watch Avoda will come up. Because Avoda literally means to work. We translate it as worship, but literally it means to work. This is why it is called service. So in saying that, there is a liturgy that is followed. There is a siddur that is followed. So what do you expect on Yom Kippur? You expect to follow what? The liturgy. It will be liturgical. It will be from the siddur. And here we follow the Orthodox. So the service will be an Orthodox service. In saying that, um, there are two parts, two main parts for Edith Yom Kippur. The first is called Kol Nidre. And then the second is called Vidui. And there are prayers and blessings in between there. Kol Nidre means all vows. And what this prayer does is it, uh, it asks God for forgiveness, number one, for broken promises. How many of you have broken a promise? Did you say you're going to do something and you didn't do it? So basically, this is asking God to forgive us for promises we did not keep. Secondly, and more importantly, this is asking God to forgive us and to exempt us from, from vows that we have made under stress, under duress. Saying what? Now, if you promise to do something just to show off, right? Just so people would look at you, or whatever, or you had the intent of doing it, but it didn't work out. Right? So you didn't keep your promise, and it's whatever, you know, it, it's just uh, uh, your humanity or whatever, your failure. That is something different. But when when, during the Inquisition, when the Spanish soldiers came to the synagogue and rounded up all the Jews, marched them down to the river at the point of the sword and told them, convert or die, many of the Jews converted. This is what we mean by making a vow under duress. Now you're making a vow. You're, you're converting under stress or what have you. And so basically, Paul Nidre is, is a confession of that. But it's asking God to forgive and to exempt you from that vow. Because your life was at stake. Your life was at risk. It's kind of like um, these people, the young man last year who was uh, arrested by the North Koreans for stealing a painting, a picture of, or whatever, off of the hotel wall. And so they set him up in front of all the cameras and he made his confession. They had a trial and he confessed to his crimes. He was not confessing these crimes of his own volition. He was not confessing his crimes because he actually felt he was guilty or these kinds of things. Why was he confessing those crimes? He's going to die. They were, torturing. they were torturing him and he was going to die. This is what is being covered in cold means, right? It does, it, you, you are asking God to forgive you for promises that you have made that you have not kept. But at the heart of it is that those who have made vows under stress, under duress, under the pain of death, 
we ask God to annul those vows and not hold them against us. The second part is called Vindui, and Vindui is, is, as I said, this is the litany of um, sins, just to give you an idea. It says, uh, my God and God of my Father, may my prayer come before you. Do not ignore my plea. Please forgive me all of the sins that I have sinned before you throughout my lifetime. I am ashamed of the deeds that I have committed. I regret the things that I have done. Now, O oh God, take my pain and suffering of atonement. Forgive my mistakes against you, for I have sinned. May it be your will, Adonai, my God, and God of my ancestors, that I do not sin anymore. In your great mercy, cleanse me of the sins I have committed. Uh, and as you go through it, um, you begin to you be, you begin to name sins, and we do this as a corporate body, as as an assembly. So we'll be standing here, and we'll be facing towards, more or less, towards Jerusalem, Jerusalem towards the temple. And we will be standing here, and we will be going through, I have sinned by doing this, I have sinned by doing this, I have sinned by doing this, and every sin that is spoken, we're smiting our breast because this is a sign of, this is a Middle Eastern sign of, of repentance, of, of, of sorrow. Of remorse, the smiting of the breast, and so we're going through these sins. Now, some of the sins that we go through, you may say, well, "I didn't do that." Well, I didn't do that, but you see, someone in the body may have or did do that. So, why do I have to confess a sin that I did not commit? Because, go ahead. Because, because you are responsible for your brother or your sister. Good. It is in response to the question Cain, Cain asked God. When God said, where is your brother? And he said, Am I, am I my brother's keeper? And the response to that, the answer to that is what? Yes. yes. In Judaism, the answer is yes. Therefore, when you sin, it is as though I sin. When you sin, it is as though we all sin. Why? We are one body. So, in your body, you ever have an ingrown toenail? If you have an ingrown toenail, your whole, body your whole body hurts. You ever stub your toe? And when you stub your toe, your whole body goes into action, does it not? Including your heart, including your adrenaline glands, including everything, your adrenal glands. And you begin what? Hopping up and down, holding your foot. Huh? You ever cut your thumb? Cut your finger? Yeah. And what do you instantly do? Your whole body goes into action and what? Your finger goes where? Into your mouth. So it is. You know, you can, when you have like an ingrown toenail or a toothache or, or uh, you stub your toe or you cut your finger, you, these kinds of things, it can even be, it can be, your body can have such a reaction that you actually get a headache from the pain. That even your head hurts from the pain. I, I slid this stub right here one time. My mom threw out a candle. She threw it in the trash because it had it was one of those votive candles, the big ones. Not that she was Catholic or anything like that. But those of you who used to come to camp remember the last night service where we would light the candle and everything. And I thought, hey, that'd be a good candle. That's a good candle. So I thought I would save it. She dropped it and broke it. And it still had a big chunk of glass on. So I was trying to free the candle from the glass. And I was pulling and pulling. And it went and it slipped me right there and I had it cut my tendon there my thumb wouldn't move my thumb was like this I had to go to the hospital Dr. Keeler he cut it even more he cut it an inch this way he cut it a quarter of an inch this way he reached his tweezers in there I could see his tweezers under my skin going like this and he's looking for the tendon he grabs it and he pulls it out and then he stitches it all back together 
For years after that, for years after that, I could feel the slicing of that candle across my thumb. Just thinking about it, and I would wince, I would, it would make me cringe. I could feel it. So, say what? Listen, we are all responsible for each other. We're responsible for one another. This is why we do this, why we make our confession of sin a corporate thing. The entire body, the entire assembly say, I have sinned in this way. We have sinned doing this. We have sinned doing this. We have sinned doing this. Is this scriptural? Well, the scripture says what? If you have sinned, then you are to confess it. To whom? To the assembly. Where is this coming from? And what does Yohanan, what does John say? First John 1 9. If we come on, first John 1 9. If we confess our sin, what? He's and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, Yom Kippur is both personal and corporal. Just like the individual Correct. Yom Kippur, what? He has to take care of what first? Himself. Himself. And then what? The nation. The nation. And then what? Going the world. Ahead. Listen. You can do, I can do the world no good so long as I am down. Before I can do you any good, I must make sure what? You see, if the doctor is sick and dying, how does he help the patient? Before I can be a help to you, I must be standing up first. Before I can help you stand, I must first stand. So it's personal. And then what? Then it is corporal. Then it is to the body. Say what? I stand up, and now what? I help you stand up. Not just myself, but all of us. This should be our perspective. This should be the way we're looking at this. This is what it means to be responsible for one another. Every the rabbi will tell you this. The rabbis will tell you that every Jew is responsible for every other Jew. How much? So much so that it is preferable that I take, that I sin, trying to keep you from sinning. I sin and I take the punishment for my sin so that you don't have to take the punishment for yours. Who does, does that sound like? Taking the sin, taking the punishment for sin so that you don't have to. This is a Jewish concept. This is why Rav Shaul says what in the book of Romans that, that for a wicked man, would anyone die? Scarcely for a righteous man, you might find somebody who would die. But while we were yet in our sins, the Mashiach died for us. This is what he's talking about, this concept. And so we will go through it. It takes about 20 minutes to go through this litany of sin. Now, we're going to close here tonight. Um, I guess there's a reason why God had me forget uh, my laptop. But it's important for us to understand what Yom Kippur is all about. And to understand what we're doing and why we're doing this. It's not, just, it's not just going through a liturgy. It's not just going through rote and routine. Nor is Shabbat. There's a purpose to what we're doing and why we're doing it. What's being said and why it's being said. Whether it's the Shabbat liturgy or it's Yom Kippur liturgy. By the way, the Shabbat liturgy is the Yom Kippur liturgy. With a few changes. Because the liturgy is the liturgy. 
The temple service does not change. The temple service is the temple service. So the synagogue service is the synagogue service. It doesn't change, with few exceptions. And as I said, what? What is put in? Call in the to be doing. Also the pro uh, uh, prostration before God, as we call out the holy name of God, we literally prostrate ourselves to the ground at the, at the calling out of his holy name. Are we able to use anything on the floor? Or Excuse me? Are we able to use anything on the floor to do that? Sure. You can have a carpet, a rug, or something, whatever. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Um, and for this reason, of course, uh, the men are put to the front, the women to the back. Um, these kinds of things. But... To, to understand what's taking place. That the rabbis say this, listen that we must force we must force our minds and our bodies to comply that it not be routine to you that everything that you speak this is true of all the liturgy this is true whether it's on Shabbat or whether it's on Yom Kippur or such as this that whatever you speak that it is done so with intent that you're thinking about what you're saying. You're not just rattling through. You're, you're thinking about what's being said. Okay, so you've said this a hundred times. The reason is to ingrain it in your brain. Ingrain it in your heart. You know what happens when I'm praying? Because we have gone through this liturgy so many, 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 many times. that parts of the liturgy start inserting themselves in my prayer. Avinu Shem Shemayim, Yikadesh Shemcha, Avinu, our Father, Shem Shemayim, which is in heaven. Avinu Shem Shemayim, Yikadesh, Yikadesh, for your name, uh, or for holy, Shemcha is your name. And you know what comes into my mind after I say that? Part of the liturgy. Ata kadosh, veshimcha kadosh. Ve kol chayo, hakodeshim yechaluch hasela, baruch ata Adonai ha'el hakadosh. You are holy, your name is holy, and your holy ones praise you every day. Blessed are you, Lord, the God who is holy. I was praying one day, our Father in heaven. Holy is your name. And those words started coming out of my mouth from the liturgy. Why? Because they've been ingrained here. Does that mean, what does that mean? I mean it, what I'm saying is. You are not to vainly. This is what Yeshua meant when he said, about vain repetition. It's not that you're not to repeat things. Everything in the temple was repetition. That you are not to do it in an empty way, that it must have significance every time you say it. And so what? He said, uh, um, so the rabbis say that you may not memorize the liturgy. You are not permitted to memorize the liturgy. Because if you memorize the liturgy, there's more of the chance, more of the opportunity that you simply do it through rote and routine. So it is forbidden for you to memorize the liturgy. To do it purposely. So that you must look at your prayer book and you must look at the words and you must read them with purpose and you must say them with purpose, with the intent of the heart involved. <clears throat> now, the, the, there is a dress code for Yom Kippur. I don't say too much about Shabbat. But Yom Kippur, there's a dress code, and the dress code is formal. Because this is a this is the high holy day. Not holiday, 
only day. And it is customary to wear white on this day, as in a white shirt, a white blouse, to dress ties, suits and ties for the men. Formal. And I don't apologize for this. It is what it is. And so in saying this, just a, some correction here, just some understanding, so we understand what's going on and what we're doing, why we're doing these things. This is not modern Christianity. Where people just come into a... a what, 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 what is the interior of the church called? Where the people gather, where the congregation gathers. It's called the sanctuary. Coming from what word? Sanctuary. Sanctuary. Sanctum, meaning holy. It is a holy place, and yet people are coming in flip-flops, shorts, tank tops, whatever. I'm serious. They can do it for the courts. Yeah. 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 You better not go into the courtroom that way. You go, you go before a judge looking like that? He'll throw you out. He'll throw you in jail. If you go in there, be quiet. Because you're showing disrespect to the court. I mean, yeah, when they first arrest you or whatever, but you go in there for trial. And what, what does the lawyer do when you go in for trial? He puts you in a tuxedo. You're shaven. You're clean shaven. You're washed. You're bathed. Your hair is combed. Everything. You look like a whole different person from that arrest picture. That war picture. Why? You're showing respect to the person who has the authority to do what? Lock you up and throw away the key. How much more to God, who is our judge, who has the right to do worse than that to us? There is a protocol. And remember what we said, that these are dress rehearsals. Moedim, these are dress rehearsals. Dress rehearsals. Everybody say dress rehearsal. Dress rehearsal. Which means what? Dress. You dress how it's going to be. And how do we customary, how, how, what, does, what does the book of Revelation say? When Mashiach comes, how are we going to dress when we appear here? Robes of white. This is why. Why? Because John was what? A Jew. And he understood these things. Let me read you something real quick. Are you going to get to the other words? Not tonight. <laughs> that's, that's all that will be on our next, next list. Okay. This word up here? Is Azuf, everybody say Azuf. Azuf. And Azuf means to desert. Okay? No, no, no. Not desert, no. Okay. <laughs> is this desert or is it desert? I'll have some desert, please. Desert. I.e., forsake. Eli, Eli, Lama. Remember it? We did gave you that a few weeks ago. Okay, so this is the Hebrew word. I told you that the other one was Aramaic, so this is the Hebrew word. And what we're going to do is next week we'll get it. Not next week, because next week is Sukkot. Sukkot. Next Wednesday is Sukkot, and we'll be having the Sukkot festival here. Yes? Look what we're yeah. Five days after Yom Kippur. So when we get back, hopefully things will get uh, back into a better order. <laughs> so 29.30, yes. The fourth is Paris Oak right here. Yes. 
because this is where we shake the four species before coming. Okay. I mean, the, the seven species. The blue line. I forgot because last year we, we didn't have one because we, well, the white was a celebration. Yes. Anyway, so we'll get back to things. Let's close with this. Matthew chapter 22. Is how you dress important to God? People say, uh, well, God looks on the, man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. So don't judge me. This is true. But what? Man does look on the outward appearance. 22? Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's a wedding feast going on. And the father of the group sends out all the invitations and nobody shows up. You know the story. So he finally sends out people and he invites whoever will come. But watch this little kink in the, in the, in the, in the story. Verse 8. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy, so go into the highways and byways, invite everyone you find to the wedding feast. Now, I've heard tons of messages on this passage. Go out into the highways and byways and invite them to come in. And those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look over the guest, he saw a man there. Notice very carefully, he saw a man there who was not dressed, how? In the appropriate clothing. Friend, he said to him, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? But the man was silent. The king said to his servants, Tie him up, hand and foot, and throw him out into the outer darkness. In that place will be weeping, gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Oh, that's where that verse comes from. Who, all was, who was called to the wedding? Everybody. But was he allowed to stay? No. Why was he not allowed to stay? He was not dressed appropriately. You mean if I wear this into church or I wear this into assembly or if I wear this on Yom Kippur, I'm going to go to hell? No. As in everything Jewish, all of the outward structure is a picture of what should be going on inwardly. The reason why I'm dressing up outwardly is not because God is going to forgive me if I wear a white shirt or He's not going to forgive me if I wear a white shirt. Rather, I'm dressing up. This is a and This is a dress rehearsal. I'm dressing up as a demonstration of what my heart is inwardly to Him, i.e. what? Before whom do I wear a suit and tie? Before whom do I wear a suit and tie? How about here? Who, before whom down here would I wear a suit and tie? Someone I respect. I.e. what? The judge? Right? The president. So, a couple of years ago, my brother, he's the superintendent of the PSJA. He has this fantastic school thing going and so he was invited to the White House with uh, three other superintendents from across the country. Four of them showed up. Four of them were invited to the White House. Do you know they were not allowed to show up? However, do you know that the White House actually sent them a dress code which they had to follow if they were going to be allowed into the White House if they were going to see the prison. They had a dress code. Say what? They could not just come in slovenly. 
They couldn't come in in jeans and t-shirt or whatever. They could not even come in with, a, with dress pants and a dress shirt, open collar. They were required to wear belt, shoes, they were told socks, matching, everything. They, they had to have a, a suit and tie and everything in its place. And you know that they were checked when they came in. There, was a, there were guards that stood at the, at the gate of the White House and looked them over to make sure that they were attired appropriately to stand before the President. If this is so for the President of the United States, how much more so before our God and our King? Is how I dress important? Yes. Why? Because of what it represents. If I'm disrespectful on the outside, listen to me, if I'm disrespectful on the outside, I guarantee you, I'm going to be disrespectful on the inside. If I do not care enough to take care of my outward appearance, what is my inward appearance? You see, it's not just the changing of the inward man, it is the changing of the whole man. But even in the Sador, when you open the Sador, my Sador, it tells you there's a dress code. The way the way we dress the way we dress here and, and honestly we're we're kind of clamping things down a little bit. Okay, we're tightening it up little by little. This is the way we started, introducing a little bit of the of the liturgy and a little more and a little more and a little more. And tightening things up. Okay? But if you were in an Orthodox synagogue. There's a man who stands at the door and he looks you over. Even at a Margaret was telling she doesn't do that here. And at there it was like she felt so underdressed. Yes, so yes. I, I attended the Reform Synagogue. This is the liberal synagogue. It's kind of like the liberal church, you know, where whatever. Everything else. I went there for ten years. Do you know that in the synagogue, in the, in the Reformed synagogue, for Shabbat, the men all wore suits and ties. I wore suit and tie for 10 years. Every Shabbat, all the men wore suits and ties. The ladies did not wear all wear dresses, but they all wore pants, suits at least, but it was a suit. You understand what I'm saying? I.e., it was dressed up. So what am I saying? I'm saying this should this should not be the uncommon the uncommon occurrence among us. This should be the common thing. Why? Because people should when they look at you on Shabbat, when they look at you on Shabbat, you should not look like you're going to a football game or the beach or what have you. And I know this rubs people the wrong way, but it is what it is. You should be as though you're coming to have a conversation with who? And who is God? He is the what? He's the king. So you should look as though you're having, you're coming to have a visit with the president. This is the way it should be. Okay? So just sharing that with you, throwing that out there for you. Uh, so next week, uh, no class next week um, because of the because of the festival, and then the following week we will get back to class, and then we will be starting after that. The week after that, starting the um, starting the beginner Hebrew class. So we will get to uh, Azuf um, next week. Uh, it will help a lot if I have my laptop with me. All right, so. I apologize for that aspect of it. So, hope everybody's cool with that. So, with that, we say, Rakot Shalom, Lelai Latov.